Hello from the incredible castle buttress high up in the Drakensberg Mountains in South Africa. I'm on the back end of a five night, six day hike with a group of photographers who uh, have kind of been through it to a, to a certain extent. Our second day in particular was really tough, coming up a pass called Rockeries Pass in some pretty poor weather. We did 1100 meters of ascent, getting to about 3000 meters. So that's a really tough day, even with the support of a team of porters that we had with us. But we have seen some incredible things along this trip. The hiking has been fantastic. And aside from that second day, we've had some amazing weather and some fantastic sunrises. And that's why I'm up here. I want to shoot sunrise tomorrow morning and I'm up here scouting for shots that I think will work in the sunrise light that's going to come from the ridge behind me. But the light's obviously quite good right now so I might take some images to show you but the main thrust of this video is going to be finding that composition anticipating what the light is going to do in the morning and then I'm going to do a start to finish so I'm going to go through all of my camera settings take the image and then we'll go into the edit uh, and I'll show you how I process my photos. So I'm going to start with this area where you just saw me record that clip uh, because these yellow bushes are covered in the most wonderful flowers. If I just come in and look at this one here, they really are quite wonderful. And I've actually been up here before and, and been in the Drakensberg many times and I've never seen the flowers quite as good as they are uh, this uh, early December. This is actually December 1st I'm recording this video. Uh, but the problem here is that whilst we have all these lovely uh, round yellow bushes here, we do of course have what looks almost like uh, the kind of gorse we have in England, a rather, uh, well, I think quite ugly bush there on the left hand side. It, even if you don't think it's ugly, it's certainly distracting. And whilst um, there might be some photographers who'd want to do something with that, uh, I think I'd like to leave it out of my composition entirely. And so instead, I think I'm going to move across here. So bringing this dead bush um, into frame, which I actually do think is quite interesting, perhaps coming a bit lower and then trying a portrait frame. So I'll play around with the exact camera position in this kind of area. And uh, I'd always recommend if you're looking for compositions and you think you found something, you do take the time to, to tweak the camera position to make the most of it. And certainly coming back here would allow me to zoom in more, which makes the bush smaller relative to the crags in the background there. So uh, let me show you uh, the composition that I've ended up with. I don't love this image, but I've done an okay job, I think, with the structure of the scene. And obviously, you've got this fantastic view uh, out into the distance there. Um, but the main idea was having this sort of life and death combination, the dead bush and the very colourful flower-covered bushes in the foreground here. But that dead bush to me just feels a bit ugly and also a bit lost because there's that bright green bush immediately behind it. So although conceptually it might have worked, I'm not sure that it really does here. And now that I've taken that photo, just as a point of comparison, I thought I'd show you what happens if I get closer to this bush to eliminate that more distracting uh, plant on, on the left there. Because that's certainly one alternative is to try and simplify but you can see that in order to get the bush out on the left hand side there I have to get really quite close and for me this bush just becomes a bit dominant and this could be an artistic style here you can maybe see a four by five ratio frame that that might work um, we could even come a bit higher and perhaps slightly further back and shoot as a square or even portrait but for me it's more interesting to have those multiple layers that you saw in the previous photo just moved a few meters away and turn the camera around 180 degrees to show you the view in the opposite direction that is the cathedral ridge which is what i'm planning to shoot at sunrise but uh, this bush down on the left has more of these wonderful yellow flowers and i'm wondering if i can incorporate that into a composition but you can see that as i try to bring it in towards the cathedral ridge i have a problem with this rock creeping in on the left hand side so I then have to move the camera around the rock which means getting closer to the flowers than I would choose to do uh, and here the rock isn't quite hitting the camera um, but uh, if I want to really get the the bush aligned with the ridge then I need to move the camera even further across and I think at this point whilst the composition does work as a portrait it's potentially a little bit too simple uh, but I am going to shoot this now and I'll show you the result of the focus bracketed exposure. 
this shot really surprised me actually because I, I think it's actually pretty good um, but it's not an approach that I would usually take I don't often get really close into my foregrounds like this I generally find it looks pretty weird um, and in this case it works well but um, it's certainly not in keeping with my style so perhaps I won't actually include it in my portfolio but we do have this amazing contrast between yellow and blue and some fantastic lighting on that background ridge. Um, there's one change I'd probably have to make to that colour contrast though because I find yellow quite a difficult colour particularly if it drifts into the greener side of yellow and particularly when it's very vibrant like this so I think I'd have to slightly desaturate uh, the yellow and shift it a little bit towards orange and then that for me creates a much more pleasing color but yeah pretty surprised that this one uh, worked as as it did there's actually seven photographers on this hill at the moment uh, and we're enjoying some lovely late afternoon light but i thought i'd quickly show you a spot that i photographed in a previous drakensberg video when i was beginning my vlogging adventures and that was with this tuft of grass coming out of these rocks very much unchanged scene from when I was here a few years ago, which is actually quite nice to see. But I'm interested in these flowers that Ian is uh, photographing. So what I'm actually gonna do is, is talk you through Ian's shot, maybe uh, offer him some ideas uh, and then come up with a, a shot of my own. Okay, so let's have a quick look at Ian's shot here. So I'll just zoom in on his screen to talk through the composition. And it's quite interesting because he's shooting much wider than I would be inclined to shoot this scene, partly because it diminishes that cathedral ridge in the background, but it does bring in this incredible sky structure, uh, as well as some nice flowers towards the bottom left. So this is actually a really interesting composition. Possibly if I shot it like this, I'd be inclined to crop it to four by five, just to lose a bit of space from the right. And maybe I'd have a bit of a play around with the camera positioning, getting a little lower and zooming in ever so slightly whilst keeping that wide effect. Uh, but a really interesting photo, um, but quite different, I think, to what I'm going to uh, try shooting now. So this is a brilliant image by Ian. I really love this composition with scattered boulders and flowers and plants and grasses in the foreground, all very sympathetically lit. Uh, and then that fabulous ridge in the background in that blue tone coming from the haze which gives you this nice sense of, of depth coming from that colour shift from blue to, to warmer tones in the foreground. So it works really well as does this wide perspective and it's that that I wanted to talk about actually because I tend to shoot this scene in quite a prescriptive way um, which is to look at the hill on the left hand side and decide that it's too heavy and to look at the space on the right hand side and think that it doesn't hold its own against that interest that comes from the ridge and so I end up framing uh, more or less as you see here with some slight variations uh, more or less every time that I've visited this location that's maybe four or five times now uh, and it's really interesting for me to see the approach of different photographers on my workshops because I can genuinely learn from that experience and try to unpick some of the thought processes that I have that may actually uh, restrict me somewhat and this is certainly an example of that uh, and, and that's really because I tend to frame in this back to front way so I frame the mountains in the distance first and then try to find foregrounds that work well with that backdrop framing and I think that has worked very well for me and is actually quite effective in, in the final shot that we're going to go through in a second um, but nevertheless this is a really great image that has a lot of perspective that I don't get from these longer focal lengths I tend to shoot this scene at uh, and it's an idea that I'll have to take forward uh, when I have the chance to go back here. So I think what I'm going to do here is a little different to what Ian has tried and that's just to really simplify and get into these flowers and partly that's because I've never seen these flowers in the Drakensberg before and they are absolutely stunning and I really just want to fill the foreground with them maybe shoot them in some really soft light so I'm thinking rather than waiting for sunrise light maybe shoot them in the pre-dawn when there's a nice warm glow uh, both on the flowers and the mountain ridge behind so I think this is the likely composition that I'll shoot and I'll just show you a quick uh, portrait photo uh, of what I'll try to complete tomorrow morning so this is my practice composition and obviously it's uh 
a bit of a luxury to have the time to practice uh, but if you do have that time then it can be hugely beneficial particularly uh, if you're preparing for the following morning sunrise when otherwise you might be trying to find compositions in the darkness uh, but in this case it was particularly useful because I actually decided uh, that this wasn't such a good image. Now that I've tried this shot in this kind of position in that vertical format much tighter than this I've noticed that yellow bush sticking out behind the white flowers and that for me becomes a bit of a distraction with that very uh, simple framing. So what I think I need to do is come back and up to bring in more patches of flowers, more grasses, more broken rock and it makes that yellow patch of flowers less of a feature while still allowing those lovely detailed white flowers to shine because they have by far the most contrast. So I think I'm actually going to change my idea and come back to shooting in this position. Well, good morning. You won't be uh, seeing my face because uh, I have the face of someone who hasn't quite slept enough tonight, but uh, it's looking very, very promising for sunrise. In fact, it's looking very promising right now, even though we're a good 40 minutes away from sunrise, or 50 minutes even. Um, so you can see my flowers there slightly shifting around in the wind. So I'm expecting some motion blur in my shot, and I'm just gonna have to work with that at the moment because at this light level, uh, there's really nothing I can do about that. Bumping the ISO and uh, opening the aperture only gets you so far. So uh, I'm going to uh, try this uh, repeatedly as the light keeps changing um, and I'll show you my camera settings as I do that. And you can probably see a little flash of lightning there in the distance as well, which is pretty cool. Okay, so I am all set up and if I just press the info button here, you can see my composition and the beautiful light that we have currently. Um, I should say that the light is changing so rapidly that I'm currently overexposed. So I'll press the info button here and I'm actually just going to go to ISO 100. I should say that I've already shot this image. I think the light was uh, even better a second ago, um, but I'm now going to uh, just talk you through my settings here if I were to shoot this now. So you can see I'm at 50, 15 seconds and F11 and ISO 100. And uh, what that 15 seconds means is I can't use the uh, auto focus bracketing feature, which I certainly need to do even at f11 uh, with this uh, shot as it is here. And sorry, the camera is struggling to focus uh, because there just isn't that much light. So uh, what I do in this case is I'm going to uh, press on the nearest point in the frame, uh, that rock there, uh, and then we take a photo, which uh, is going to take that full 15 seconds. So uh, don't hold your breath. Um, but then I simply just click on uh, different areas, shifting further and further back, taking that photo in sequence to make sure that I have every section of the image perfectly sharp. Um, and I think the, uh, the exposure I took earlier was actually at uh, ISO 400 and F8. So uh, you have to be even more careful there with the focus bracketing. Um, but I think that's, uh, that's it for the shoot now because uh, that shot is, is complete or it will be when I've uh, finished taking the set. Um, and we can now hop across to the computer where I'll go into the edit. Right, so here we have our four focus bracketed exposures. Uh, and if I just compare the first and last here, uh, then you'll see if I press the information key that they were taken just two minutes apart and yet there's quite a significant exposure difference between the two and that is purely uh, due to the light getting brighter. So that's something that we will have to uh, adjust for at a later stage because our general practice here is going to be to edit just one of these frames in Lightroom and then we're going to copy those edits across the other three images then adjust for that exposure difference, and then finally bring them into Photoshop to do the actual focus stacking. So let's start by editing this first frame here. Uh, press the D key to uh, go into the develop mode. And uh, if you want to understand my white balance settings here, then do watch my white balance videos. I won't go into that, but suffice to say, this is what I consider to be natural color. 
Um, so we're going to start actually by just making this general foreground area looking good but I am going to do my usual trick of darkening the highlights and boosting the shadows just a bit to give us a starting point where the uh, tone of the sky and ground are a little closer together and then I'm going to add some contrast to compensate and as I do you can see that that foreground gets a little bit too dark and we're forgetting about the sky for now so I'm just going to boost the exposure and you can see as I do these uh, flowers start to get a little bit hot so uh, I need to be a, a bit careful about how much I boost the exposure so that I'm not clipping the highlights because we can always do that at a later stage but we can't really recover them so that looks about right um, maybe we can boost the shadows just a little bit more just to open up those darkest areas of the image uh, maybe a tiny bit more contrast slightly darken down that exposure so all of these work together uh, and I'm basically editing this uh, foreground portion of the frame and the ridge line all together because they're roughly in the same tonal range and now we're going to worry about the sky and we're going to correct the sky and make it a bit darker by using a sky selection here uh, which should do a brilliant job because the ridge line is, is very well defined uh, so if we just darken that down I just want to show you what a whole stop does because or similar to a whole stop because that starts to look really weird and I generally find that anything more than half a stop looks bad when you're using this adjustment in this case I think even half a stop is a bit much so we're just going to do a third of a stop and that gives us a nice transition between the mountains and the sky behind the tonal relationship looks natural but the top portion of the sky still looks a little bit washed out so I'm going to add a second uh, local adjustment here in the form of a linear gradient and we're just going to drag this down over that top portion of the sky. Uh, slightly darken it, uh, how much is that? Again about a third of a stop uh, and then we're going to add a little bit of contrast just to bring the, the sky structure in. Uh, and looking at this bottom portion of the image maybe that's a fraction uh, dark as well so another linear gradient uh, just to boost that ever so slightly and you can see that I'm making tiny adjustments here relatively quickly and that tends to be the way that I edit so I'm really looking at what different areas of the image might need and trying to do that make those changes in a fairly subtle way so here I'm just going to uh, darken down the top left corner there because it was just looking a little bit bright compared to the slightly slightly darker side a really tiny adjustment there so I think this is looking pretty good certainly for us to go into Photoshop and do our, our further editing once we've uh, copied these settings across to the other exposures but one thing I do want to do is crop this because I'm not sure that we really need this extra blue sky coming in at the top of the frame I'm not sure that we need all of this uh, cluttered space at the bottom either um, so I'm going to crop to four by five which is my preferred ratio for for portrait and you you can see we use lose quite a, a significant portion of, of the image there but I think all of the important elements are retained uh, and so we're just creating a, a more pleasing uh, format generally by making that crop okay so let's go back into our, our grid here and we can see um, these are the edits that I've made now we want to copy these across to the unedited images so we can just select them all by holding down shift and clicking on the one on the right there and uh, click D to go back into develop mode and you can see that they're actually selected on this film strip and we could have just selected them there it's a bit quicker and we select sync here um, and make sure that we've got absolutely everything checked including those masks that we just uh, just created and this should make all of those images look almost identical apart from the natural brightness change uh, that, that was caused by the light just getting brighter as I took those images so let's go back into the grid mode again and you can see this brightening effect happening as we go to the right so what I'm going to do is select the right hand image now and just try and figure out how much darker we need to make this um, so I think it's going to be between half a stop and a stop isn't it um, so just by eye this looks about right to me so I'm guessing that it's going to be pretty similar to that so if I select the uh, left image and we compare yeah I mean they're looking uh, looking pretty good there um, so we can just click between the two as well 
yeah, so that that's pretty much bang on. Uh, so I think that's about six, um, two thirds of a stop even. So let's just try darkening this one by a third of a stop. Well, that's slightly too much, isn't it? But anyway, let's let's just have a little play here and correct them as we go. Okay, so that the first two look the same. The third one's still slightly too bright. Uh, so still slightly too bright. This isn't great watching, is it? It's like uh, watching paint dry, but there you go. That's uh, that's pretty much bang on now, and uh, the same with that fourth image. So all of these are now exactly the same in terms of their edit and exposure. So we're ready to combine them now in Photoshop. So I'm going to select all four images here, and I'm going to right click and choose Edit In and then open as layers in Photoshop. And what that will do is open all four images into the same Photoshop file. So we've got our four images opened as layers in Photoshop. And if I just turn off the visibility of the two middle layers, then you can see uh, the bottom layer there is focused on the background and the top layer is focused on the foreground. And you can actually see there's a bit of a zoom shift as I go between the two images there. Um, so what we're going to do is select all four of these and we're going to select Edit, Auto Align Layers and leave it on Auto. And what Photoshop will do is just scale those layers so that that zoom effect disappears and we'd have to crop later to uh, compensate for the fact that some of the uh, some of the frames are now too small, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm also just going to flip the order of these layers around because I find it intuitively clearer when the closest focused foreground uh, image is at the bottom of the stack here. And then I'm going to turn off the visibility of all three layers uh, above it and we're just going to see the focus change between the closest focused layer and the one just behind it um, and you can see that there is a lot of overlap in the depth of field and that's really important because it means that we can actually paint very approximate layer masks uh, when we're combining these images. If you don't have those comfortable overlaps then you might want to be using a program called Helicon Focus to do this, um, to do this uh, automatically, this um, focus stacking. Photoshop will do it with uh, edit um, auto blend layers here um, but it does a really poor job so I wouldn't recommend using that at all to be perfectly honest uh, you're better off trying manually so I'm going to create a new layer mask holding down the alt key and that creates a black layer mask so that this layer above doesn't show at all and then we're going to paint white into the area on the mask uh, that we want to show so this is going to show the uh, the layer above. Oops, I've got black selected here. So there we go. X key switches the colors. Okay, and now we're painting sharpness in and we're going to uh, paint black on anything where we where we go too far or just undo. So I think we went too close there on, on the foreground. Uh, I can probably see this better than you on my screen. Um, so I'm looking for really small changes in sharpness actually um, because even this area that I'm painting in looks sort of acceptably sharp as it is. Uh, yeah, maybe up over that rock. So I'm not spending loads of time being really accurate with this. The goal is to paint a white band all the way across the image because that's the section that's sort of closest focused. And then we can just very approximately uh, zip up the image like that and paint the rest in white um, just because that's quicker in my experience than switching to the paint dropper tool and then we're on to our next layer and we do the same thing we um, well first we can zoom in and check where this layer is actually focused let's go one step further to 100% uh, so let's turn off the visibility of that layer uh, and then turn it back on and you can see those grasses in the background and the flowers in particular get much, much sharper. Although they're not perfectly sharp because unfortunately they were moving in the wind a little bit in that 15 second exposure. So new layer mask, uh, hold down Alt to create that black mask. And then we've got the white brush selected and we're just going to paint in the sharpness in exactly the same way, just as approximately because I know that we've got this amazing overlap in the depth of field. And that really is a crucial thing to, to have. Um, 
it, it's why spending extra time getting your images right uh, is time well spent um, because it makes this job so much easier and faster and actually you get better results as well for slightly complicated reasons that I, I can't be bothered to explain. <laughs> um, okay, let's uh, click on that mask with the Alt key so we can see it again and just paint white up to the top of the frame. So we've already got two of those masks done and now we've got the final background mask. So let's zoom in to 100% again and just see where that's sharp. So you can actually see that the bush here is pretty much sharp even on the frame that's focused for the background. Um, but obviously the background is, is much sharper in that final frame. So a final layer mask and we can paint over the top of the bush and you can see actually it gets a little bit sharper if anything. And these grasses blowing in the wind are actually our friend because they, they make it a lot easier to hide these um, blend lines uh, if there were any problems. Uh, but in this case it probably would have been fine even if they were perfectly still and sharp. But where it gets more complicated is where you have to paint the mask around every blade of grass and so on. It uh, becomes very tedious then and that's when you might want to program uh, like Helicon Focus. Okay, so alt click on that mask, zoom out, bigger brush and we are done. We have finished our focus stack manually um, and the key again is that overlap in depth of field of the frame. So perfectly sharp at the back there with the ridge line looking absolutely wonderful. And then if we come down here, we've got a lovely detailed foreground and I'm showing you this at 200% zoom so you can see that it really is a richly detailed image. I just wish that these uh, flowers could have been perfectly still, but at least you can see uh, the detail of them. And when it came to when it comes to printing this, I probably would spend a bit more time sharpening those flowers more specifically. Okay, so let's make some very final adjustments. I, I don't think there's much that needs doing here. Um, obviously, we can do our crop, which I'm just going to do very imprecisely because annoyingly, uh, Photoshop doesn't seem to have a way of making that sort of. Um, cling to the few pixels we've cropped off uh, in, a, in a really uh, clean way but anyway that, that'll do. Uh, okay let's confirm that and we'll do some final uh, curves adjustments. So uh, I'm going to have a look uh, and, and set a new white point here to try and brighten this up a little bit and just add a tiny bit of contrast. Um, and as I drag this to the left, actually, you can see that we already have some red channel clipping. So I'm going to be careful and mask out those, those areas um, when I actually apply this adjustment. But what, what I'm looking at really is the uh, hills in the background. And when that clipping starts, that's where I'm going to stop. And then we're going to paint away with black paint uh, again onto this layer mask the area of the flowers that was clipping there and you can see that that uh, that becomes very obvious if you just do uh, that 100% darkening in that local area and similarly on this rock. So we're actually going to paint 50% over the entire foreground and that's going to um, and actually let's just uh, we don't need to brighten up these edges in the bottom of the frame anymore now. Um, so that corrects all of the areas that, that we're clipping. Um, so there's the, the change that we're making. And actually, I don't think that we need to um, wash out the background quite so much. So we're just going to drag this curve down. That's going to recover some of the contrast in those midtones. So that's the before and after now. Now you can see it's had a really beautiful effect. Uh, on those distant hills and of course the sky uh, is way overcooked now so uh, we're going to select the mask again uh, and paint just 50% at a time just to see what it looks like I mean that that looks pretty good for most of the sky but let's do a little bit more uh, in that bottom area there okay so that's the before and that's the after um, and I think I'm actually just going to add a bit of a vignette here um, and I'm going to do that manually so I'm just going to create a curves darkening curves adjustment here I'm going to control I to invert that mask so that change is now isn't applied anywhere then I'm going to select a white brush and I'm going to paint in 30% so I've just used the three key to change the opacity and let's just uh, build up a bit of a vignette oops <laughs> uh, in uh, in the corners here Actually, that makes that color look a bit bit funky. 
Yeah, so this is just, just holding in the eye. Sometimes I vignette, sometimes I don't, but I think in this case it works well. And I think we're done. So not an overly complicated image to edit. It probably has been quite complicated for you to follow through with me if you're not familiar with Photoshop in particular. Um, so apologies for that, but I didn't want to make the video too long. I will be doing a processing course later this year. I know I've been promising it for forever, but I've invested in some uh, sound equipment and so on so that I can do that well so keep your eyes open for that uh, if you do have any comments please comment below uh, and and follow me if you want to see more videos I should be re releasing a couple more from this trip to the Drakensberg uh, in the next couple of weeks thanks very much for watching